I want to start by saying that I am not a Calvinist, nor am I Arminian. I see biblical truth and inconsistency in both theologies, which in my eyes renders both as false. And actually, in fact, I believe that this divide is just one more scheme of the devil to cause division within the body. It makes people choose one side or the other, and I believe there's a middle ground. I would refer to myself as a traditionalist, as someone like Leighton Flowers would say. But for the sake of this video, I want to focus on why I believe Calvinism is wrong. And I realize that many people may take offense with this, but please don't. Followers of this channel can agree to agree on exposing the false teachers in the New Apostolic Reformation, even if we don't agree on this topic or other topics like the Tribulation or timing of the Rapture. I'm going to get into the biblical verses that I think clearly show that Calvinism is wrong towards the end of this video. Nineteen years ago, when I was first saved, I watched a video that started off really good but ended up being a video on Calvinism. I was confused and heartbroken. I went to church the next Sunday and I stood there just feeling empty. Any joy I had singing praise to God was not my own. It was only because God chose me to love him. And excitement I felt for God wasn't really mine. I was one of the chosen that more or less was a robot doing what I was programmed to do by his election. All of my enthusiasm to carry out the Great Commission and preach the gospel was really just a waste of time. If some people are created with the sole intention of burning in hell, they have no need to hear God's word. And if only the chosen are the ones to be saved, then preaching the good news to them is yet another meaningless service that benefits nobody. They will be saved whether we tell them about Christ or not because God made it that way. So for those who are new to what Calvinism is, a basic view of this would say a Calvinist says that some were made by God to go to heaven from the moment they were conceived and the others were created to go to hell. Neither class of people ever had a choice because God made it that way. They were predestined to one fate or the other. Now, if that's the case, then in a very harsh kind of view, God is this power-tripping creator that made some people for the purpose to spend eternity with him and the others he created to suffer and writhe in anguish for eternity. They never had any hope from day one. He just sits up there watching this puppet show that he created. None of us truly love him because he's programmed and created us this way and he knows this but he's satisfied with the false love he's created. This makes no sense to the loving God we read of in the Bible. So as far as predestination goes, I think that scripture illustrates to us that God has a plan for all of us. He has equipped us with skills and talents and gifts and has a purpose for everyone. Once again, he gives us choices all along the way. And if we don't listen to him all the time, he will make the best out of that situation for his glory. Look at Abraham. God told him to wait for a child, but Abraham got impatient and impregnated his handmaid. That wasn't God's destiny for him, but God can make the best out of any situation. Now, here's an example how I see predestination. A family business has been run and passed on from father to son for many generations. Bob and Mary are no different and have big plans for their new baby boy to take over the company business. During his childhood and teenage years, Dad has always tried to involve their boy in activities that would teach him the ways of the business. When he graduates from school, something shocking happens. The boy decides not to carry on the family business and breaks over 100 years of family tradition. He was predestined to take over the business, but by the power of free will and personal choice, he did not. I believe God has a plan for each of us too. He has predestined each of us for a purpose within the body of Christ, a plan that will fulfill us in him and allow us to use the talents and gifts we have been given from him for him. It's our choice to ask God for our purpose and to follow his direction, and if we do, we will probably live a much more fulfilling life. But we know that nobody perfectly follows God's plans for us. We all make mistakes in our process of sanctification. So 
perhaps there is one thing that God did want to do, which was give us a free choice to love him, and then only then could he receive genuine love. But a choice to do so is necessary. God doesn't want robot love because it's not real. It's no different than the artificial intelligence we see in robots today. It may seem real, but it's not. And is that what God wants? I don't think so. Now, Calvinism says that people give themselves credit by saying we choose to follow Christ and that if we choose, we're admitting we did something and therefore Arminians. It's classified as a work. But we know the Bible says we can't do anything to earn salvation and therefore cannot do anything to be saved. Our works or deeds do not get us any closer. His salvation is a gift and the fact that we accept that gift is not actually doing something. A decision is not works or earning or achieving anything. Now, given there are many verses that support Calvinism, but only if they disregard other verses that oppose this view. So in most cases, they twist scripture to support their view. This is called eisegesis, and it's exactly what the New Apostolic Reformation does. Although I'm not saying that the two are anything close from being from the same camp, I believe my pastor and MacArthur are true brothers in Christ, but their Calvinistic views contradict the very clear message of salvation they preach. In fact, it was actually just last Sunday my pastor preached such an awesome message on salvation and how anybody in the congregation could repent today and give their lives to Christ right now, that it's not too late. They can make that decision today. But a light went off in my mind that said, you don't really believe that because you're Calvinist. You believe they don't have a choice. You believe that some are heaven bound and some are hell bound. So why are you preaching a message that contradicts what your Calvinistic view teaches? Truth is, I don't think he's really a Calvinist. He understands the true message of the gospel, and that's one of the reasons I love my church. I think he's just followed a certain Calvinist teacher so much that he sees him as flawless, as many do with a few of these big Calvinist preachers on the internet today. So here are a few Bible verses that I believe clearly show that God wants everyone to be saved and that he has not predestined anybody for damnation. 1 Timothy 2, 3 to 4. This is good and it is acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. Now, the last time I checked, all meant all, but the Calvinist has to twist this to mean something else to support the verses that seem to promote Calvinism. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So once again, nobody to go to hell, but everybody to come to repentance and salvation. 1 John 2, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. How much clearer can it be? Christ died for everyone, not just those God chose to be saved, as the Calvinist believes. And 1 Timothy 4.10, and therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. So this once again shows that Christ died to be the Savior of everybody, but he is truly the Savior of those who believe. Fact is, God doesn't need our help with anything and can do it all by himself, but he chooses to allow us to participate in the family mission, so to speak. Here's an example. A man is about to push out a rowboat for a day of fishing. Now, he's done it many times before and he's fully capable of doing it by himself. But he sees his four-year-old son watching him and says, hey buddy, wanna come over here and give me a hand? The young boy gladly rushes over to help his father. With eyes of joys, dad looks at his son pushing the boat with all his might and offers him a little extra helping push. He says with encouragement, keep it up, son, you're doing great. We've almost got her in the water. With a final shove, they both get the boat fully into the water. The boy looks up at his dad with a sense of accomplishment in his eyes and a smile, and the father looks at him saying, thank you, son, we did it, well done. 
I think God works with us in the same manner. He doesn't need us to do anything, but allows us to be part of things and experience accomplishment, joy, esteem, and worth because he loves us. And a true Christian is going to turn that thanks bad back to God for allowing us to be a part of his plan anyways. Now, if you're anything like me and have gone through struggles in life, I'm sure you've asked yourself the same questions I have at times, and especially when you're going through a struggle. Why has God allowed me to understand him and know the truth when the majority of the world never will? Why me, Lord? I know I don't deserve it, so why? Why me? Why did I believe? Why, when others were given this calling to repent, why didn't they react in the same way? Why do I desire to know him more than some, but not as much as others? Why was I born in Canada, and I've never been in need like those born into poverty or a, a third world country? Why have I been so blessed than others that love God so much in countries and suffer and will never get to be in my situation? And the list goes on, but the answer is, I don't know. Yes, I have some better answers to those now as I've grown in Christ, but not all of them. Now, for the Calvinist listening to this, they're saying, see, you were chosen and others weren't. God gave you the ability, but he didn't give that to the others. And all the other verses that support Calvinism, which I do believe, but just not in the same way they do, just as they don't believe the verses that I quoted before saying Jesus died for all men and God wants nobody to perish in the same way that a non-Calvinist does. I don't think that we're supposed to be able to fully understand everything about God and his ways. This is where faith comes in. Why can't we just say we don't understand everything about God, but we do know he's fair, just, good, and gave his life for all. And he's given us a choice to accept or reject his free gift. Why we accept and others don't is the mystery of free will. Now, if you want to get much deeper on the topic of soteriology, I will leave a link to Leighton Flowers at the bottom. He is great, and he goes into much more depth in this than I have in this very short video. I'd love to hear your comments. Maybe Calvinism is correct, but I don't think so. If you are a Calvinist and you want to comment, please uh, go right ahead, but don't quote all the scriptures that support Calvinism, because I know those. Uh, Instead, show me the scriptures I quoted and show me that they don't mean what they actually say. But until next time, think about this, take care, and God bless.